We may not have been around when our ancestors lived, but there were witnesses to the important events in their life. And in her new article for Family Tree Magazine called Witness Testimony, author and genealogist Robin Smith explains how witnesses can help you in your genealogy research. And I'm very happy to say she's here now to tell us more about it. Welcome to the show, Robin. Hi, such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm so happy to have you Thank here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, yes. of course. We were just chatting. I think we met years ago at a, at a conference and you have certainly been continuing to be busy in the genealogy world. Uh, you're blogging on Reclaiming Kin, is that right? Yes, yes. That's been my passion project for more than a decade now. And so that's where I share all the tips and all the things about skill building that I've learned. So the focus is skill building, but also I focus on the special challenges of researching the enslaved as well. And, and since Zoom, I actually also uh, offer webinars through that, uh, through Reclaim and Kin as well. So it's just been a wonderful, it continues to grow and my audience continues to grow and it's just a pleasure. I know it's, it's a wonderful community, the genealogy community, and uh, all of us continue to grow. I learned a lot from your um, article in Family Tree Magazine. And I wanted to chat with you a little bit about that because I think researching witnesses is fascinating. And it's something that maybe people don't always think about. You know, we focus on the names we recognize and not so much on the ones that we don't. Um, I'd love to have you kind of give your, um, your elevator speech, if you will, is why should people be taking the time to research witnesses? Okay. So most of us in the genealogy community, eventually we hear about this thing called cluster research. And we, we hear this phrase, the fan club, that genealogist Elizabeth Schoen Mills conceived, this friends, associates, and neighbors. And I would consider witnesses and bondsmen in that fan club, in that cluster. And simply put, they can just help us find more family. Uh, that's the benefit of researching the people, these individuals and the records in which, which they find them. We can break through some brick walls and it can also tell us about the community ties and some of the customs in that time and place. So witnesses and bondsmen are always my secret, secret research strategy. And I hope will be yours too. Now you mentioned bondsmen, and that might be a new term for folks. You know, we might be used to seeing perhaps uh, an immigration record or a birth record, and we see witness. But bondsmen, explain to us what that is. Okay, so this is one of those terms in genealogy that has a slightly different meaning historically than it does today. And so by bondsmen, we just mean someone who pledges a sum of money as a bond for another. And sometimes in these records, we might uh, see that they're called a surety. You might see that term used. And so you can see the difference between that and a witness is that there's a financial obligation involved. And so you can imagine, I always try to tell people, it's similar to co-signing a loan today. And most of us would probably not co-sign a loan for people that we didn't trust or that we didn't know very well. And so if you can keep that concept in your mind, that's the value and the benefit of researching those witnesses and bondsmen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, gosh, when there's a financial tie, <laughs> there's some kind of relationship there. And I guess if we can <laughs> research them, that might lead us back even to more records of our own ancestor. Um, so absolutely. what kind of records are we going to find witnesses and even more specifically this term bondsman? What kind of records are we looking for? Yes. So the big ones we think of, of course, marriage bonds. We hear that phrase a lot. So marriage records, almost all deeds are going to have some sort of witness involved, wills, and there are also the other records of probate. So executors and administrators often have to have bonds. If you're going to serve as guardian to someone, typically that person has to have a bond as well. And so those are sort of the big ones. We can also think of court cases, civil court cases, when you're trying to secure cure someone's appearance uh, at, a, at a future court meeting. And I've actually have seen 
the courts go after that bondsman if that person doesn't show up. So some of these records can get pretty juicy. And of course, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with um, pension, military pension records and Southern claims. So I would consider those witnesses who are going to provide their testimony. They might not be there in person, but you're going to have a body of people involved in those records as well. The only thing that I would caution people to watch out for is sometimes it really is just the county clerk or a local lawyer or local justice of the peace. So it's in researching that witness or that bondsman that you'll find out uh, the relationship, if there is any, to the person of interest that you're, that you're uh, researching. That's a really good point. <laughs> good, good kind of warning up front. I'm, I'm wondering yes. as, as you're looking at witnesses, are, do you kind of go after them primarily because you're wondering, are they related or is it also about that fan principle where they may not be related, but researching them might actually lead me to more about my own ancestor because of their, whatever their relationship was. What do both of those play into the way you approach them? I would say both. I'm actually really excited when I see a witness or a bondsman um, because the curiosity serves you very well in genealogical research, as we know. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to be nosy when yeah. you're a genealogist. So I want to know why is that person there? I mean, that's that's the question that I'm trying to answer. And more than a few times, it has led me to more family that I didn't know about, particularly if that individual had a different surname. Now, another got you is that sometimes they end up in the records with their just their initials, right? So we first got to confirm who that person is uh, before we can, we're ready to say that they're related to our person of interest. So our, there are some sort of cautions that we need, need to be aware of as we're doing this research. But I, I'm just, I, it's another uh, stone to overturn as you're doing your research. And I love it when I see a person listed in a record. I'm just, I'm excited. <laughs> Me too. I, I feel like, oh my gosh, I finally have another avenue that I can pursue, yes. uh, particularly in the yes. walls. So in the article, you kind of help people figure out exactly what the process would be. I mean, you have a, a three-step research process, which I think is great because sometimes you see that name and then you're not sure how to go about it. Uh, walk us through just sure. briefly what that three-step process is. Okay, so the first thing that I do when I find a document concerning my ancestor that has a witness or bondsman, the first thing I do is transcribe the document. I want to make sure that we all kind of, you know, are comfortable with the practice of transcribing, but that's going to make sure that you are actually reading every single word in that document. It's going to help you notice all of the details that you might miss if you're just looking at it in this its current format. Um, there are a lot of great free tools available to use for um, transcribing. There's Genscriber, there's Transcript. And I would also recommend Family Tree's um, cheat sheet on reading old handwriting. So that comes uh, becomes very handy when you're doing this transcription. So the second step is to then do the research. I always say you want to research in a variety of records, and I actually research the person as if they were my ancestor already. So I'm looking in census records and deed records and court records and everything else trying to establish who this person is. And the things that we learn along the way um, are not just that that this person is in this time and place, which is very important to us as genealogists, but it also gives us a hint as to how old the person was. And it also tells us, uh, gives us a hint about their literacy in terms of whether they sign with their mark or whether they sign with a signature. So it's in this second step that you probably uncover that the person uh, is related to your family when you're doing this deep research. The third step is to actually research the laws because as we know, laws governed everything about the sources that we use in genealogy. And they're gonna govern who can serve as a witness and a bondsman, how old that person has to be, and also how many were, were necessary. So we, we need to be aware that these laws are going to differ from state to state or colony or a, a locale and also throughout time. So 
I look at the published state laws that I can find in databases like Internet Archive and Hottie Trust and um, Google Books, but you can also visit your local library, law library in your archives um, if you've really got to do some deep digging. So those are the three steps that I recommend. Transcribe the document, research the individuals you find, and make sure that you research the laws. Fantastic advice, really. I, Robin, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about the transcription because I think that is a step that can be tempting to skip, right? People think, oh, well, I read it. I, I want to get going. I want to add people to my tree. Will you tell us a little bit more about that? I know, you know, you do a lot of research. What kind of advice do you have for people to, why, again, why they should take that time, but also you mentioned a couple of the tools. What are we looking for instead of just uh, typing the words? What else are we looking for? So, Transcription to me is one of the basics of one of the basic genealogical skills I think we need to master in order to be successful, particularly once we start going back further in time and, and encountering those much more complicated problems. And it's one of those basics that will remind you if you don't do it uh, over and over again that, that there's a reason why it's recommended in genealogy. I can't tell you how many phrases I've realized as I'm transcribing that I don't fully understand. And step one is to understand what that document is telling you. And so uh, if there's a phrase I come across, I might email an archivist. I might call one of my genealogy friends who's got a little bit more experience in that particular time and place. But transcribing helps us to do that. And it helps us to understand um, and now, when I transcribe, I also typically turn it into an abstract, right? And I'm also making sure that I do a citation. So to me, those are the building blocks of successful genealogical re research. And when you start skipping those kinds of things, um, I would also include uh, keeping a research log having a research plan, those to me are kind of very critical res uh, building blocks to long-term success in genealogy. So the transcription, I, I understand the impulse to wanna, to wanna skip it, but I can tell you over and over again that I come across phrases that I thought I knew, but once I'm transcribing it, I really realize that I don't. So, um, there are lots of wonderful webinars and classes that you can take on transcription. It's a very simple set of rules when you're transcribing, and they're easy to, to, to learn. They're not uh, complicated rules. And I think that once you start doing it, you'll get more comfortable with the process and it will really become second nature. So I hope that I can encourage everyone with our conversation to do more of that transcribing. I did a lot of it earlier, not necessarily knowing or understanding all the rules. And now I'm going back and sort of revisiting those documents. It's, it's always amazing when things will jump out at you, isn't it? <laughs> you didn't, you either didn't yeah. see it the first time yes. or it just didn't resonate. I mean, yeah. Things you miss, things you never saw, things yeah. you, you know, I always recommend having a genealogy buddy. So things you go, hey, you, you know, can you take a look at this and tell me what you see? And so having new eyes look at it and ask you a question. So, um, but I, I find all of this, you know, I'm a genealogy junkie. So I find all of this really, really exciting to me. Um, so I kind of lean into it. And I try not to do, you know, we've all got other things to do in our lives. And I just, you know, an hour here, it might be an hour this weekend, but I'm sort of just always working towards a goal. And uh, that transcription, boy, I tell you, that's a key first step. Absolutely. Well, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd love to know, have do you have a story? Do you have a witness story or just something uh, that you spotted that you just would love to share with us? I'd love to have you inspire our uh, viewers to, to no, really go for it. You know I do. You okay. know I do. Um, my mother's family is, my maternal family is from Tennessee. And so when I was researching my second great-grandfather, his name is Mike Fendricks. Uh, in Tennessee, where he lived, uh, almost every source in his life 
uh, asserts that he was born in Alabama. And so this is a problem that a lot of genealogists have. I had no idea where in Alabama, um, even though I thoroughly went through all of the sources that were available in that time and place. So I noticed that he served as bondsman to a man named D. Suggs. And then I noticed that he took a couple of sharecropping, uh, jointly took a couple of sharecropping um, deeds with the same man, D. Suggs, and that he was living in D. Suggs' house in 1920. So, you know, the wheels start turning. Why is he interacting with this man? And D. Suggs was also born in Alabama. So when the records ran out for my ancestor, I started researching D. Suggs. And where did D. Suggs lead me? D. Suggs led me back to Lawrence County, Alabama. And in that 1870 census household was a man named Mike. And that man ended up being his brother. It was his half brother. And the same man is my second great, great grandfather. They had migrated to Tennessee together. They had been formerly enslaved. And I found a Freedmen's Bureau contract that, that their mother signed where she calls all of them her children. So it wasn't just, you know, the 1870 census doesn't provide relationships. Right. So I had that critical labor contract that said Sophrona and her four children. And so, you know, it makes all the sense in the world why he's associating with him and living with him and uh, jointly, you know, promising bond for him. It is because they were half brothers. I knew you'd have a great story, that Robin. Was <laughs> that is fantastic. Oh, my God. I love, and, and that story is the crux of my cluster genealogy uh lecture that I do. I go into kind of more details, but following D is what led me to that community and his his uh, place of origin in northern Alabama. And so it was very exciting. And so, you know, I took that excitement in my curiosity about other people into all the other places that I research. And I know you bring many stories to your readers at uh, Reclaiming Kin. Tell us uh, the URL address and what they will find there at your website. Oh, thank you so much. So it's www.reclaimingkin.com, one word. And I call it a genealogy teaching blog. And what I mean by that is I might start off with with something from my family history, but every single post is meant to teach a skill. And so every post there talks about a methodology, a strategy, or a resource. So it's not just about my family history, it's about helping all genealogists to grow their skills and also meet the special challenges of researching the enslaved. So I'd be really happy if your listeners would, would um, come to the blog, take a look, sign up for my mailing list, and I'll send you a free PDF of all my favorite research tips. Fantastic. And, and the fact that you illustrate those resources and strategies with, with captivating stories, it's well worth the read. Um, Robin, thank you so much. We'll all look forward to your article, Witness Testimony, in the Family Train Magazine. And um, I look forward to hopefully talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on today, Lisa. Bye. There's so much more to learn about doing transcriptions. Check out my full length video class. It's part of premium membership and it is going to tell you everything you need to know about how to do transcription, the tools that I recommend and so much more. And along with that video class, you also get the downloadable handout. Uh, becoming a premium member has a lot of perks, so go check it out. Go to genealogygems.com and you'll find a red button on the homepage with more information about premium membership. Thanks so much for watching, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.